My name is Fred Sanchez. Uh, Company me is uh, 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 Cache Arrington. Both of us are park rangers at Andersonville Natural Historic Site. Today is President's Day, September, I mean February 16, 2009, and we are at Andersonville National Historic Site in the media room, and we're going to be conducting an interview today with Rudy Freshly from uh, Fort Myers, Florida, and he's accompanied by his wife, Miss Judy. Um, Mr. Freshly was a prisoner of war during World War II. He was a prisoner of the Germans. Uh, Mr. Freshly, please begin by telling us where you lived prior to your enlistment. I was, my home was in Hazen, North Dakota, okay. but I was going to college at the time at Fargo, North Dakota, which was North Dakota Agricultural College, which today is North Dakota State University. Give us a brief outline of your military career prior to your capture, beginning with your enlistment. Well, I actually went down to enlist uh, shortly after Pearl Harbor, on Wednesday after Pearl Harbor, but I didn't pass the physical right away. So I had to have some surgery, and then I passed the physical on Valentine's Day of 1942, and was a, uh, assigned to the uh, air... Air Corps cadets uh, unassigned. There were there were no vacancies right then for cadets, so they sent me home. But I received my military checks every month, and then in August I went to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and was inducted there, and went from there to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which was a classification center. And then following classification, I was uh, classified for pilot training. And I went to Maxwell Field, Alabama. When I arrived in Maxwell Field, Alabama, they had too many cadets. So they sent 16 of us out to San Antonio, Texas. And we went to what is now Lackland Air Force Base, but those days it was called Upper Kelly. We spent about nine weeks there in pre-flight training. After nine weeks of pre-flight training, we went to Coleman, Texas, and I had my primary flight training. I should mention that while I was in college, I had taken civilian pilot training, and I had a pilot's license before I even went into the Air Corps. And then um, after primary flight school, we went to San Angelo, Texas, and that was basic training, 
We were in BT-13s, and from there we went to Waco, Texas for twin engine flying school. And I had nine weeks of flight school there, and on the 26th of May of 1943, I got my pilot's wings. It was a commission to second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there I kind of bounced around uh, to various places uh, to get into. I had a very close friend who said if we volunteer to be uh, co-pilots on B-17s, we can get into combat. And if Hitler was killed, the war would end and we would not have seen combat. So we hurried down and asked to be co-pilots on B-17s. And I went to uh, various transition schools in uh, Oregon and Idaho and uh, Washington, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And uh, it was very fast. I'd spend 10 days here and then they transferred me to another crew at another place. And finally, uh, in uh, July, we flew over to England. That was July of 43? July of 43, we flew <coughs> over the B-17s. And there were a whole bunch of us. There were 200 that took off mm -hmm. at Gander Lake, Newfoundland, uh, the night we left for uh, England. We actually landed in Scotland and um, it was quite a, a difficult time because they didn't have good air traffic control. Um, we were stacked up uh, in the clouds, couldn't see each other, we didn't have radar, we didn't know where the other planes were and uh, we know that two planes collided and all the crews were lost that night from those two planes. Mm. But that was, uh, then we got to England and we got to uh, uh, Bobbington, England, north of London, and that was a sort of an assignment center, and they assigned us to the 384th Bomb Group in uh, Grafton Underwood, which was just outside of Kettering, north of London. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the missions that you flew prior to your being captured, and if you want to, take it up to the mission where you were shot down. This is very easy to do because I was shot down on my second mission. Your second mission. <laughs> <laughs> and the first mission was a mission to uh, uh, Watton, France, W-A-T-T-N, and it was a, a missile uh, site launching. The first buzz bombs came out of Watton, France mm -hmm. and were sent towards England. <coughs> and um, uh, we were badly damaged on that flight. The plane was badly damaged, but there were no <coughs> no serious injuries to the crew, and then uh, from there we uh, uh, we came back and we had to fly the. I, I volunteered to fly the plane over to another base because it was still flyable, mm -hmm. and could be eventually repaired, and I wanted to get in flying time experience. Right. And then on the second mission, it was to Stuttgart, Germany, and Stuttgart was my father's birthplace. And my father and mother were both born in Germany and came over to the United States uh, just prior to World War One. Okay. Well, you can water. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. Let me hold on. Let's pause for a second. Okay, Mr. Fraser, let's continue. So you were talking about, um, you were mentioning that you were, you were going to go on your second mission, which is what you shut, when you were shut down. Oh, we're still Okay, right. Okay. And when we got to the target, we had a great deal of difficulty as um, in the formation flying. I was flying co-pilot, and this pilot I was flying with uh, was from Brooklyn, New York, had never driven a car, and here he'd gone through pilot training and was flying an airplane. And I didn't feel he was very competent, and he had a difficult time with formation flying. And when we did finally, we were really getting low on gas because if you don't, <coughs> if you don't handle the throttle smoothly, Mm -hmm. um, you use up an awful lot of fuel. So we were getting low on fuel by the time we got to the, um, the target. target. So when we uh, uh, got over Stuttgart, there were clouds over the city. And so uh, uh, General Travis was, was the uh, lead plane of our mission. And uh, we crossed over Stuttgart, turned around, came back and crossed over the second time. And by the time we came over the second time, we had 20 minutes of gas left on the plane. So we knew we were in real trouble. And um, then at, when we came over the second time, we were hit by flak, and our number three engine was knocked out. So we had three engines left, and we couldn't keep up with the formation, and we dropped back. back. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of fighters came in from the side. They were uh, Messerschmitt 210s. 
and they fired rockets at us. And it was the first time, I, I didn't even know there were rockets on airplanes. First time I ever saw them. And when they came towards us, everyone had Rudy red right on the front of it. I, I just knew it was going to get me. And one of them did hit, and so uh, uh, we jumped out right afterwards. Yeah. Actually, I do know about the fact of, of the rockets, obviously, but you're actually the first interview that I do that was actually shot down and hit by rockets. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's kind of interesting. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So then uh, uh, we bailed out, and uh, I remember in bailing out that I got into the Bombay, and uh, it's scary looking when you look down and the Bombay doors are open and you're looking down 18,000 feet at the ground below. And the engineer was standing there, and he says, what do I do now, Lieutenant? And I said, just watch me, and I jumped out. out. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Were you able to complete your mission? Were you able to drop your load before? No, no, we, we salvoed the bombs after we left Stuttgart, right. and we were over a forested <laughs> area. At that time, uh, they didn't believe in bombing uh, civilian air right. uh, places, in spite right. of what the Germans say. Right. We were trying to hit the... Uh, uh, targets that were important. Military. Military, tar yeah. yeah. Strategic. So you had to drop your bombs in somewhere. So we dropped clear, them yeah. over a forest and, uh, <clears throat> and, and right, right about that time is when we got hit. Tell us a little bit about, you know, once you landed, obviously you landed at safety, you know, in your parachute, you know, where exactly were you and how did your capture come about? Well, it wasn't safely that I landed because there was a a strong wind that day, I would guess about 40 mile an hour wind, and I was drifting across country rather rapidly. Mm -hmm. I didn't open my chute until I was probably at eight or 10,000 feet because we were on oxygen at a higher altitude, Absolutely. and I didn't have a reserve bottle along, so I just held my breath and, and waited as long as I could and then opened my chute. Mm -hmm. and I was drifting across country r rapidly, and I was there was a high tension line and a railroad below, and I just kept drifting right alongside the, the high tension line and eventually I tried to steer the chute because they'd, we'd never really jumped before but we'd taken instruction you'd pull the shroud line and you could turn nothing happened <laughs> I just kept going towards that high tension line and it came fast uh, your depth perception doesn't sit in until about the last 200 feet and then all of a sudden it was right there and I knew I was going to hit that line and when I hit, I was probably still 40 feet up in the air, and the chute collapsed, you know, the minute the mm -hmm. shroud lines hit the uh, high tension line. Nice. And so down I went, and I was knocked unconscious. And when I came to, uh, I could hear these Germans talking. And I, I could speak German fluently. I understood what they were saying. And they were debating uh, what German base I might have been from. They thought I was a German pilot. I had on just a flight suit. And I didn't have, there was no insignia, insignia. or uh, American flag. We didn't have any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were debating where I was from. And I said, uh, uh, when they asked me what base I was from, I said, my mother's hometown. I didn't know where any bases were. So I said, Lundau. And they started to laugh. And they said, that's a, in German, they said, that's a sailplane base. <laughs> and you, that wasn't a sailplane. Right. So then... Uh, now, were these German civilians or military? These were German civilian mm -hmm. home guard farmers with shotguns Guns. or yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. and uh, But they were not at all malicious because they didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. So then they said, uh, um, Aha, Englander. And I said, Nein, Americaner. And they said, North or Seat, or North or South American. Mm -hmm. And I said, North. And they said, Ah, Canada. And I said, nine for anything stop in the United States. Right. But I had never thought of, uh, uh, when you say you're from America, that uh, South Americans are Americans right, too. Right, right. Um, now, how old were you at the time of capture? Well, I had a severe head injury. I had, uh, I actually had a fractured third, fourth lumbar vertebrae, and I had a fractured metatarsal in my right foot. Mm -hmm. And I had difficulty in walking, and both my hips were were uh, sprained, and uh, so it was very difficult to move. But when they're holding the guns, you walk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where, where, where were you taken? I was taken into a farmhouse, mm -hmm. and uh, I sat there for probably a half an hour before the Gestapo came, 
and uh, these were brutes. These guys, they were, they gave me bad treatment. Uh, tried to ask me a lot of questions, and they were very upset that I spoke German so well. But I wouldn't speak German to them. The farmers had told them that I spoke German, and but when the Gestapo came, I just gave my name, my rank, and my serial number. So every time they said anything, I'd say my name is Rudy Freisley, my rank is second lieutenant, my number is O-680626. And I just repeat that each time they said something. What happened? Do you know what happened to the rest of your crew, bomb crew? Well, um, by uh, mid-afternoon, I was taken to uh, Sand of Old, uh, to a um, city hall in Sand of Old. And uh, four of the crew members were there. Uh, the navigator, Tex Shackelford, was there, and, and three of the enlisted men were there. And so uh, uh, they interrogated us there, but they were very uh, civil. These people were much different than the Gestapo. And then uh, uh, they took us to a jail in Metz, which is now in France. And we spent the night, each of us, in, uh, in separate dungeons. And I've been back there since to show my wife and the children the <laughs> where they kept this. Let me ask you something. Once, you know, the trauma, you know, we interview so many POWs, they all talk about a different trauma that they experience during capture, particularly in this case, you being a pilot and having to jump out. But once you realize that you were captured either by the, you know, the home guard or once that you were turned over to the Gestapo, what thoughts went through your head once you realized that you were going to be a prisoner? Do you I, recall? I don't recall that there were any particular... Uh, um, I had no fear of dying. I, I, I kind of assumed that maybe I'd be killed, but I, I didn't worry about it and didn't get much thought. I'd never taken this prisoner thing seriously. They had told us uh, in England that we might become prisoners, but I never gave it any serious thought. Did you receive, whether in the States prior to your departure, your deployment to England or in England, did you receive any kind of training to prepare you in case you were captured as a prisoner? I, I know that we were uh, told some things that we were to try to remember to do. I remember we uh, were given uh, 45 caliber pistols, and I really was never good at shooting one, so I never took that very seriously. <laughs> and uh, they and we had escape kits, but uh, they must have taken my escape kit away from me right away because I never saw it anymore. You did say that you went through a little bit of interrogation. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about your interrogation and? Um, you know, were you punished in any way when you didn't give the right answers? You know, were you... Tell us a little bit about that yeah, time that, period. That, that part I, I don't like to recall. Okay. Okay. Um, after this jail that you went to, this dungeon, tell us a little bit about you eventually left from there. What time, you know, when was it that you left and where did you go from there? How were you transported? We were there all night. And then uh, we were awakened quite early in the morning. The thing that I remember most vividly were there were rats in this thing. And I'd try to go to sleep and the rat would be crawling over me. And that was very disconcerting because I never had anything like that happen to me mm -hmm. uh, before. Um, so that morning, uh, I don't recall that they fed us anything. We got on a train and the soldier that was assigned to us, um, first thing, I spoke German to him, and he says, uh, don't tell the the uh, Germans about your uh, injured foot or your back or anything, because these German doctors are butchers and they'll just take your leg off. So I didn't complain about anything. Mm -hmm. So and again, you said you were in Metz, France? Mm -hmm. And so where were you taken from there? From Metz, we went to uh, uh, Dulag Luft, which was uh, just east of Frankfurt, probably uh, 20 miles east of Frankfurt, or 20 kilometers. Okay. And was that the camp that you were to remain for the... Oh, this was, uh, uh, Dulag meant uh, a Durklag, or, or a, a through camp. Uh, uh, it's a camp where they assigned you to the, the main, main camp. camps. How long were you there? I would <coughs> guess probably two weeks. I know I was in solitary confinement for about uh, 12 days. 
and uh, during that time uh, we'd tap messages on the walls uh, uh, by Morse code to the guys in the other cells just to... Now usually it. in this camp from our understanding in various interviews a lot of you also went through some rough interviewing at the stage, right? Were you interviewed there and questioned again, interrogated? I was interrogated, but not roughly there. Not roughly no. there. No. And uh, the thing that surprised me was how much information they had about me. Uh, mm -hmm. After uh, I had been there almost two weeks before they interrogated me, and by then they had apparently assembled the material they had, but they had uh, uh, a copy of my uh, Eagle Scout certificate and the, uh, my transcript of college credits. Hmm. And this was very disconcerting to think there were people back in the United States who were providing the Germans with this type of information. Was your, was your flight crew still, I know you were in isolation, but were they still all together? You were all still in the same place? Or no. had you all been split at that We'd time? Been, we had been split. And I didn't see my enlisted <clears throat> men anymore after we got to, uh, to this uh, uh, camp at yeah. Mm -hmm. Other than inter some of the interrogation that you had there, what were the conditions in that temporary camp? You know, what did, you know, how was sanitary conditions? How were you fed? How many times were you fed? What kind of food did they give you? Well, as I recall, it wasn't bad at all. We had, uh, if I remember, we had two slices of bread in the morning and we had a bowl of soup at noon. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, uh, I think there was uh, uh, a little sausage or something. but. Uh, it was adequate. It was adequate. So after the two weeks that you were there, where did you go next? Uh, then we were transferred to uh, uh, Stalag Luft Three, which was at Sagan, Poland. It was Germany then, mm -hmm. but it's in Poland now. And it's about 90 miles southeast of uh, Berlin. Okay. And that was your main camp for at least a good while, right? Yes, about the next 16 months I was... And when did you get there? <clears throat> Do you remember? I got there in uh, October. I don't remember the date, but I do remember that they did have a little um, camp hospital. And um, so as soon as I got there, they admitted me to the hospital. How was the treatment at the hospital? Well, that was very good. They were Ameri uh, British doctors. doctors. And uh, they did the best they could with what the material that they had. Can you give us a little bit of the description about the camp, you know, as best you can recall? You know, were you, for example, in barracks? And if you were in barracks, how big were they? How many men per barrack? And those kind of, you know, descriptions. Yeah. Well, the barracks uh, were wooden barracks. Uh, they had no insulation whatsoever. And uh, just a, s a single outside wall. There was no, no inside wall wall right. and uh, very drafty. Uh, we had uh, double deck bunks at the time. The bunks had uh, solid uh, wooden slats all along the bottom and then a straw mattress on top of that and, uh, and a kind of a straw pillow mm -hmm. and uh, I think we had one or two blankets and we slept in our clothes. Uh, there were no nighties, <laughs> no pajamas or anything. <laughs> And how, how many men per barrack? Do you remember? Um, we were in the combines, and when I got there, um, I was the uh, seventh man in the combine, and then we gradually got up to eight men in the combine, and we had six combines on each end of the barracks, so that'd be close to a hundred men in, in the barracks. And at the end of the barracks, we had a, a room where the uh, barracks commander and his adjutant said, the, the commander I think was a captain or a major at the time, mm -hmm. and his adjutant was uh, the next rank below him. Were the barracks self sustaining in the sense that you had, um, you know, toilet facilities, kitchen, cooking, or, or was it just for sleeping? It was um, mainly for sleeping. There was a urinal uh, at one end right next to the cooking room. <laughs> it was foul. It was really bad. And then there was a, a, an outhouse that was very, very primitive. Um, uh, you learned uh, that you were all good friends when you went to the outhouse. So were your rations provided to you raw and you were responsible for cooking them? 
or what was our our rations uh, at the time I arrived we were receiving Red Cross <coughs> parcels and we received a parcel every week it was very good at first and we also got a loaf of bread a week from the Germans and we often got uh, a piece of liverwurst or a piece of sausage and uh, at noon uh, they uh, would give us some soup uh, from the cookhouse and then sometimes we would ask not to get the soup and that we wanted the raw materials and we'd cook it ourselves in our barracks. We only had a stove uh, at one end of the barracks. No, there was a stove at each end of the barracks. And, but it was a very small uh, cook stove and we must have used coal for fuel. I don't remember wood, but I, I, I do remember some coal. And um, we'd assign, uh, when we had eight men in our combine, we had one man as the cook and then one man to do the dishes. They didn't really get any benefits unless they stole food, but I don't think they ever did. They did, yeah. Uh, to go back to the medical, uh, other than your conditions, the result of you jumping out and you know hitting those last 40 feet, mm -hmm. what are the kinds of medical problems that the prisoners suffer of? You know, what are the, what are the diseases do you recall? Well, I think pneumonia was, uh, was probably the most common thing because it was cold and um, we were very confined and when somebody got sick could just move from one bed to the next, you know. Being the time that you were captured, you obviously went two winters, right? Yeah. Two winters. And did they provide you any kind of additional clothing? Because obviously that area gets very cold during the winter time. N not that they provided us with, that I recall, but we did get um, I know I got some clothing parcels from my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Cross notified her that she could send some things. And she was very, very thoughtful. Um, gave me uh, earmuffs, for example. No, <laughs> probably two of the guys in the camp had earmuffs. And I had a, a hood uh, that she knitted. Uh, just my eyes looked at like you're using the skiing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the nice scarf she made and the mittens that she made. And I had a lot of, these things weren't readily available during the war, and she made these things, she did them. Right, right. Um, were there, do you recall prisoners dying in, during this time period, during this 18 month period? I really don't recall um, many deaths, you know, I just, I can remember one fellow that was shot when he stepped out of a barracks during an air raid. We were told not to go outside during an air raid and one fellow made the mistake of going out and they shot him. That's about the only thing that I really remember. Well, that's a good question to ask as you bring that up. What other, besides, let's say, camp rules, besides not being able to go out of your barrack on an, on an air raid, what are the rules, what are the camp rules do you remember? Well, the warning wire around the edge of the, the camp was about 40 feet from the, that was much further, we had more warning than they had in this Andersonville prison. Right. We had about a 40-foot space in there. And since I spoke German, one of my jobs was when they played softball, uh, invariably the ball would roll out into the, the warning area. And then I would contact the nearest guard and I wore a, uh, a bib that had a, t a target on it. And I'd go out and walk with my hands up and pick up the ball and then toss it back and uh, I wanted to be sure that all the other guards knew that I was walking out there. And uh, there were about uh, six or seven of us that would do that. So so you obviously, from the very beginning, made it pretty clear that you spoke German, right? You didn't feel like keeping it and using it. Oh, no. No, no, I, I spoke to the German guards and I acted as a translator for uh, Colonel Spivey uh, when uh, Germans would come in and they, they'd bring a translator along also who spoke English and then there were several of us who would uh, act as translators from English to German and we'd have arguments between the translators to make certain that we understood each other. Did you ever feel like you had a problem with your fellow Americans? You know, when you read history and some of, a lot of the interviews that I've done, obviously being of German descent, speaking German fluently, was there ever any rumors of maybe you being a spy for the Germans? Right away. 
as soon as I got there, uh, they they cleared everybody. They'd interview you as you came in the camp, and there was a, a captain from Jamestown, North Dakota. I was from North Dakota, and Captain John Merchant was the man who interviewed me. And the first thing he said was, who's the governor of North Dakota? And I said, John Moses. And he says, no, it's Bill Langer. Well, Bill Langer had been the previous governor, but John Moses was from my hometown, so I knew him very well. And I remember his election and had been in, slept at the governor's mansion often. So, uh, uh, but I didn't get cleared right away because he had said that I was wrong. And so it took a, a few months before they would let me in on a lot of the activities in the camp. So at that time you were still in the regular population of prisoners. You weren't separated in any no. way, fashion, or manner. No, no, I was with the, with the rest of the guy. But when uh, they had JW, was, uh, I don't know what JW meant, but it was the term that the British used for the news. Mm -hmm. And they got news from the British Broadcasting Company with a, uh, a crystal set radio that was uh, smuggled in the camp. And uh, so when they'd come around and say JW, um, they left me out. <laughs> I didn't get to hear what was going on. Oh, oh, Can you just kind of give us an overall picture or view of daily life, a typical day, you know, from the time you got up, you know, when were you given meals, uh, roll call, uh, very importantly, did you participate in any kind of work details, you know, recreation, just kind of an overview no. of that kind of activity? Well, uh, usually we ate breakfast after roll call in the morning. The roll call was quite early and we'd all fall out and uh, stand at attention in lines of three and Colonel Spivey made certain that we had good <coughs> discipline and we were very uh, good at staying there. and. And we uh, exercised. We did calisthenics after uh, roll call, and then we'd go back to the barracks and we'd have our breakfast, which was very uh, limited as to what we had. It was often maybe uh, a slice of bread with a little uh, marmalade or, or jelly, and uh, then at noon uh, we had uh, often something made with spam and. Um, Oh, there was some bully beef in the British uh, parcels, um, and then we we would get potatoes because we would uh, usually try to get the uh, we we didn't like the soup that they made at the cookhouse, so we usually asked for our own rations and cooked them ourselves. Um, we all uh, ate together. It was a very small table. We started out with a combine of eight men and uh, we would have our meals and uh, they were very sociable. Um, did you either for the purpose of the camp or for the Germans and the work detail, did you ever go out to work anywhere? I mean did you have a job or? No, the officers didn't work. Or, no. So we, uh, we didn't have any work details. The British had set up a, a Kriegi College ahead of time which was the the, the word Kriegi meant prisoner, and uh, they had instructors and had numerous courses you could take. It was set up just like a regular college, and it was on a quarterly basis. And since I spoke German and had taken German in college, they asked me if I would teach German. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and when I would start my German classes, often I would have about four classes a day, and we were assigned uh, to classrooms in the one building. And uh, they had just emptied one of the buildings and made classrooms out of it and made a, had a library in there. And uh, they had also emptied another uh, entire building, moved guys closer together so they had a theater, camp theater. And that offered a lot of entertainment. I was, um, I had played trombone and I asked the, uh, the international uh, YMCA representative for a trombone and so he got me one after about six weeks and it was a lousy horn and uh, didn't play very well and annoyed a lot of people <laughs> but uh, so you were a member of a of a band we had a little band. dance band yeah. uh -huh. and it was about uh, a 12 14 piece dance band and 
and we had some very talented musicians who wrote some good uh, arrangements, and we played a lot of the old swing music of the Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, uh, uh, Betty Goodman type stuff. Now you said that there was also a theater. Do you remember some of the some of the plays or dramas? Oh yes, we had some great great theater, and one of the amazing things was that the Germans uh, gave us, uh, I think. Uh, about twenty dollars a month uh, for spending money that the Germans gave to us, but it could only be spent through them, mm -hmm. and all we could get with this money were costumes for the theater. So we'd uh, have a play, a Shakespearean play, and the costumes would cost like uh, uh, two thousand dollars or three thousand to rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the way we spent our money. Um. You, you did mention about um, getting correspondence from your parents, so they obviously knew that you had been captured as a prisoner. Did you have the opportunity to correspond, correspond with them on numerous occasions? Did, did you receive many letters from your mother and your father? That was very slow. We were issued three letter forms a month and four postcards. And I, I was engaged to uh, my childhood sweetheart at the time. And she got two of the letters, and my mother got one of the letters. And she got two of the postcards, and my mother got two, the other two postcards. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very slow. It usually took about four months for the letter to arrive. And then I get four months later, I get an answer. What can you tell me about? Oh, let me ask you a question. In this camp, you were obviously in the American compound, right? Yes. You were all not with no. the British or the Canadians? Well, when I came in, uh, we still, about half of the camp was British. Right. And they had just completed building the uh, uh, East Camp. Yeah. And in East Camp, they had, uh, it was to be a, a British, I don't remember what the term was, but they were Brits, uh, Canadians, uh, South Africans, um, though there were, there were other volunteers that um, were in that and they went into this, they moved gradually out of our camp, and within about uh, six months we had no more Brits in our camp. Yeah. So they have been moved out, yeah. <clears throat> Do you ever remember anybody ever being paroled or exchanged at the time period that you were a prisoner? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I, uh, we had quite a few who got out with uh, disabilities. And I can remember one fellow in particular who took my German class who was really determined to get out. Mm -hmm. And finally the guy uh, went insane. And so they uh, repatriated him. And I got a card from him saying, you know, who's crazy now? No. <laughs> so he had pulled it off. And so now did you get this card while you were still a prisoner? Yes. Yes? Oh, yeah. So. How about escape? Did you ever think about escape? Oh, we we often thought about escape, mm -hmm. and um, my favorite <laughs> escape stories have to do with Daniel Downey and and uh, Panther Pullman. These were two guys in our barracks who were really crazy guys, and they loved to play tricks on the German guards. And they were they were very scary to be near because the the Germans had guns and we didn't. And here they were out to trick them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Dan Downey and I stayed real close friends for years. He died just a couple of years ago, but he would come down to our home in Florida every year and we'd have a reunion of the fellas in our barracks. And uh, uh, they made two escape attempts that were very memorable. One of them was during a snow a storm. They uh, had white sheets that they put over in themselves and they crawled out in the snow towards the barbed wire fence and the uh, the floodlights would come across the camp, and even though they were camouflaged with their sheets, <laughs> you can see this trail gradually <laughs> going <laughs> towards the edge of the camp. And we were all watching, and we were sure they were going to get shot. Sure. And then the, the, the Germans came behind with dogs, but they didn't know it, and they kept going right at the fence. And finally, they got the fence, and they took out their, they had made uh, wire cutters, and, <laughs> and they reached up to cut the wire. And then the German guards told them to get up. They were going to the cooler, which was a little prison that they put in. Yeah. And another time, these two guys got a hold of a wheel, almost like a bicycle wheel. It was smaller, and they had a big uh, uh, rod that they put through it. 
took the the tire off of it, and so they just had the rim that went over. And during an air raid, they climbed up the utility pole inside the camp, and they mounted this wheel on the on the electric wire, and one hung on one side, one on the other side, and they started going out, and they had to calculate it so that they would go out. They were going to land in the Truppenlager where the German troops were, but there was no. Once they got in there, they could get out without any mm -hmm. challenge. But <laughs> just as they got across the wire, the air raid ended, and as they jumped down, the wire flew up and it, it uh, sparks flew, and uh, all the lights went out in the camp and blew the whole thing out. <laughs> and the Germans knew that, that, that this would happen, and they yeah. captured them very quickly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, how about yourself? Did you ever try to escape? No, I, uh, not after I got in the main camp. Well, I had one chance at um, at uh, Dulag Luft near Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. I was near the gate, and I had crutches at the time. They had given me crutches, and um, and there was no security. The gate was left open, and I started out the gate, and they caught me, and that was the. Mm -hmm. You know, just as a side thing, as you know, you met Mr. Ar Arden, right? Yeah. Who was, of course, a, that I interviewed earlier, and you talked to at the museum. Um, and it's kind of strange that you mentioned about the the sheets and trying to escape in the snow, because when I asked him a question about if he knew of anybody of this man that were being held in Russia, because he was actually in Russia, and that's one of the things that he remembered. He remembered um, a couple of the, of because, the, again, they were separated. There was no officers, you mm -hmm. know. And he remembered uh, um, the officers that tried to escape by by taking some sheets and trying to do the same thing in the snow. You know, um, he does remember though. Obviously, they were recaptured pretty quickly, and they were punished severely punished. Mm. But they were not severely punished because of the attempt at escape. They were severely punished because of the fact that they stole the sheets. <laughs> so the Russians felt that they needed the punishment more as mm -hmm. a result of that than the yeah. attempt at escape. You know, so. After the 18 months in Stalag Luft III, and as you know, as the war progressed and the Americans and the Russians came closer to Germany, obviously we know by history that the camps started to empty out and you were marched to other places. Mm -hmm. Where did you go? What? When did you leave Stalag Luft III and where did you go? It was in January of 1945, and actually uh, the Russians were close enough so we could hear artillery fire. And uh, we we couldn't understand why they didn't move us out sooner, and uh, we were getting pretty nervous about it. So when they finally did make the decision, they moved the south camp out first, and then they moved the west camp out, and we were the last ones to go out the center compound, and uh, we didn't get out until about four in the morning. We stood out in the snow waiting to leave, and finally we started to go. And the, the march was really bad because uh, we couldn't move very fast. We were low priority, and we had to get off the road when any military things came by, or if even the German civilians who were coming, um, they would get to pass us. Uh, so we'd just stand out in the ditch for a while, and then we'd get back on the road and march again. And they had no food for us. They had no uh, water for us or anything like that. But we could drink snow. Right. And um, so uh, we had taken some rations along uh, that we had. We packed as much as we could. How long did you march and where did you go? It was about 10 days. 10 days. And uh, I think we probably marched about uh, 90 miles, something like mm -hmm. that. So let's say you were in, in Saigon, Germany, or in Poland, right? Mm -hmm. Where did you go from there and what direction did you go? We went uh, west towards... Um, um, mm, Dresden. Dresden. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, the one night we spent in, uh, the first night I remember is we were in a church. And I remember I was up in the uh, bell tower and it was cold. I mean, we were outside, it was snowing in the bell tower. And the guys who were inside the church were a little bit warmer, but those of us who were, but we were packed very closely together. So we kept each other warm. And then uh, I think the next night we stayed in a barn, the next couple of nights. Then one night we stayed in a factory, and there was heat in the factory. It was uh, some type of uh, 
uh, ironworks or something, and they had a lot of forges in there. So that was just heaven to be in a warm place like nice. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we never had uh, never had to stay outside the entire night. We were always in either a barn or in the in the church or. How how many do you recall? How many were marching with you? Well, I think in I think it was around ten thousand. Mm -hmm. So wow, that was a large. Yeah, I mean, columns, the <laughs> accordion all the time, you know. Right. You'd move up a little and then you'd stop, and then you move up a little and you'd stop. You couldn't keep walking. And what was your What was your final destination during that march? We didn't know. We had no idea where we were going. And uh, after we had been on the road for 10 days, they finally put us in boxcars. Mm -hmm. And then we spent about uh, four days in boxcars. And there again, we have to pull off the side when every another train was going through we'd pull off the side mm -hmm. and we were double loaded more than double loaded we had about 90 men in a car and those were 40 and 8 cars you know 40 horses right. I mean 40 men or 8 horses mm -hmm. and so we were double loaded and the conditions were horrible because we had all dysentery by that time and uh, they didn't open the doors to let us out uh, so we were just peeing on each other and it was it was a mess. Mm -hmm. Nothing to eat. I was going to ask nothing to you, nothing to drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once the train stopped, where were you? We, uh, I think, we were either in Dresden or Leipzig. I'm not sure. My memory's lousy when it comes to that. I had pneumonia at the time, and my bombardier literally saved my life because I, I didn't even know what I was doing, and he dragged me along and, and took care of me. So what camp did you eventually end up? Then we ended up at, uh, at Stalag 7A, Mooseburg, uh, just north of uh, Munich. Right. Yeah, that was, seemed to be a destination for a lot of POWs ended in yeah. at Mooseburg. So how long were, your, were you there? Just about four months. Four months. And we had probably 110,000 in that camp. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so because uh, it was, uh, they brought them in from all different camps. We had Russians. We had... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, Eastern European prisoners that were in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, that there's the war deteriorated, conditions deteriorated, so, but otherwise the conditions in the camp were similar to the conditions when you were in Stalag Group 3 as far as barracks and food and that kind of stuff, right? Well, the barracks were much more crowded, crowded at the Stalag yeah. 7A. We, instead of uh, three-tiered bunks, we had uh, 12 tiered bunks. We, I mean, there were three high, but there were 12 in each row of bunks. And um, and then it got more and more crowded, and there were a lot of people who couldn't even get inside the barracks. I was lucky because I stayed in the barracks the whole time I was there. What was your physical condition that, as far as the problems that you had as a result of jumping now, had you recuperated your health from that original time period? No, my foot and my back was still, were still giving me trouble. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was having severe headaches during that time. And I found out years later when the MRI was developed that I have a big cyst up in this side of my brain that uh, was probably a hematoma blood clot up there. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit after those Getting close to the end of the war in those four months that you were at Mooseburg, can you tell us a bit, a little bit about your the liberation of the camp or your repatriation? You know, were you taken out of there somewhere else, or were you liberated at? No, no, we were uh, all liberated at the same time, and uh, it was very exciting. We knew it was going to happen because uh, we had the crystal set radio that still was working very well. Everybody knew what was going on, mm -hmm. and uh, and we could hear the artillery getting closer and closer. And finally, we heard the rumbling of the tanks as they were coming over the hills, and we could see them coming down towards the camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the German artillery was backing up, but they were still lobbing shells all over the area. The 99th Fighter Squadron, which was the Tuskegee pilots, kept circling around the camp. Some of their buddies, my bunk mate was a, a, a Tuskegee airman, mm -hmm. and they would uh, circle over the camp just to knock out the uh, German artillery spots so we were really well protected okay. at that time uh, a lot of us were uh, hiding in the, what little um, uh, 
trenches we could dig down, you know, just to keep from the low shell fire that was going through. And I have no idea of the number of deaths or anything like that. Uh, uh, I wasn't aware of that. Do you remember the day that you were liberated, that they actually, that the Allied forces took over the camp? Oh, very vividly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, they rolled in about 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, when they did come in, they raised the American flag, and there wasn't a dry eye in the, eye in the place. <laughs> what happened to the German guards? They fled. Uh, they were all gone. They were all gone. So basically, by the time the camp was liberated, then you were all by yourselves then? Yes, yeah, yeah. except we had a lot of American forces. Right. And they immediately put uh, yeah. MPs around the camp so that we wouldn't leave. leave. But they had uh, knocked down the barbed wire with the tanks, and I would say a thousand of us walked out over the barbed wire and took off for town. Mm -hmm. And I was anxious to get cleaned up, and I had lice and fleas and and uh, a beard, and <laughs> it was filthy, dirty. My clothes uh, looked like leather, you know, they, they hadn't been washed in months. Mm -hmm. Now you still have your original flight suit? Uh, no, I, ne I never had a flight suit. I wore, uh, I just had a regular, uh, if if I had a flight suit, I don't know if I ever had one. Well, when you were shot down, your original, you know, outfit that you had, uh, it was just, it wasn't a flight suit, I guess it was your regular. I just had my uniform before, on. Uniform. Okay. And I must have had some kind of a jacket, which I, I had my leather jacket. Yes, mm -hmm. I had my flying jacket. jacket. And I, I kept that the whole time. time so. I had that. In fact, my son now has it. I had it uh, rewoven on the. It, it looks good. Good, good. Um, once after, you know, you're going into town because I do know that a lot of the POWs got out and went into town, like you said, to try to get cleaned up. And but once all that transpired, where tell us a little bit about leaving Mooseburg, you know, where you were taken from, and any. You know, you're the, the going through medical procedures and getting you back to health. When when you were captured, or when you were first downed, how much did you weigh, and then how much did you weigh when you were liberated? I weighed 168 pounds when I was shot down. I was 110 pounds when I was liberated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was not anxious to go back to the camp. I did go back a couple of days later and I took a lot of pictures. I got a camera and some film and I went back and took pictures of the camp. And there was a lot of the fellas that I saw there took pictures of them. And they hadn't uh, been organized. It wasn't any real big food or anything like that for anybody. It was unfortunate that they didn't have it. Uh, well, I suppose they didn't have it available. Mm -hmm. And I was eating much better in town. Than you were and, at the camp. Yeah. So I uh, I wasn't anxious to get back. I had one memorable experience in that uh, the first night I got into town, I uh, found out where the best house in town was. It was ahead of the Nazi party in the town, and he had fled, but his wife was there, and I told her I was going to stay there. And by then I had guns because uh, that's you could pick them up all over. They're dead soldiers laying around. So I uh, told her I was going to stay at her house. And I had no food, and she'd have to feed me, and um, and so I went to the barber shop and got deloused and and, and uh, haircut and shave, and and then I went back. She had washed all my clothes. I had worn her husband's clothes uh, uh, in the do and get a haircut. So um, uh, by the time I got back there in the afternoon, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel knocked on the door, and he said they wanted to use it for headquarters that night. I said, well, there's plenty of room. There are eight bedrooms. And I said, the ladies are very good cook. And if you bring your rations, I'll taste everything ahead of time so you don't have to worry about being poisoned. So later on in the afternoon, it was probably five or six o'clock, uh, a staff car pulled up. And uh, here it was uh, General Patton, and he had two other generals with him, and a bird colonel and a lieutenant colonel, the same lieutenant colonel that had come there before. So they brought the rations along, and I told the lady that, uh, what they would like to have. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, she cooked the meal, and we sat down. And I sat between the lieutenant colonel and the colonel. The colonel was opposite Patton at one end of the table, and then the other colonel. And the two generals were across from me. 
and they spent their time asking me questions about uh, how I was shot down, captured, and all of the questions they're asking me now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so during the whole course of the thing, uh, very little was, uh, nothing was said by Patton. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak until the very end of the evening. And when he finally did speak, he turned to me and said, are you a turtle? And uh, I said, I don't know, you know what a turtle is, but... But go ahead and tell us. But uh, he said, are you a turtle? And I said, I don't know, what's a turtle? And so he said, uh, well, ask him the question. So this uh, general that was sitting across from me asked me the th three questions, and I answered them wrong. And then Patton said, well, you could still be a turtle if you answer the next question right. And, the, the, and uh, so I couldn't go wrong on the next question. And so uh, months later, I got a turtle pin and, uh, and a card that said I was a member of the turtles. And then the, the following day, uh, I, I liberated a car from a garage. This uh, Nazi lady told me where there was a nice sports car. And so I went and got this car and I got a 10 gallon uh, tank of gasoline from a tanker and um, filled the car and kept the extra gas. And uh, they, they were headed for Munich and uh, the tanks were to cross the Isar River and they had built a pontoon bridge across the river. and. Uh, I got in line uh, with the tanks to, to go into Munich, and uh, as we we're getting to the corner where Patton was directing traffic, he saw me and he was very angry that I was, had this car in between the tanks. <laughs> and then when he when he recognized me, he said <laughs> he said a naughty word. And he says, "Go ahead." <laughs> so I went on into Munich. <laughs> So I stayed uh, on the loose for about three weeks mm -hmm. and just wandered around and I was collecting artifacts. I was picking up guns and swastikas and everything that I could find. And I had two duffel bags filled with, with memorabilia that I gathered. And finally when I came back to the, uh, I, I went into Austria and then back through Czechoslovakia and I was in the Russian zone at that time, but I had been with enough Russian soldiers so I could communicate well, knew the right words, and I got along very well. And then when I got to the back to uh, the border of Germany, there was a displaced persons camp. And I remember when I got to the camp, uh, there were a lot of people that wanted to get back into Allied hands. Mm -hmm. And not many Americans, but uh, I got up to the, the captain who was interviewing and uh, he had his name tag on, it was Harold Van Every, and he'd been an All-American football player from Minnesota, and I said, are you Van Every, the football player? And he said, you're an American. <laughs> and so I had no trouble, and uh, I was flown out of there. And then they took a bunch of us, well, um, when, <laughs> when I got to the camp uh, uh, with my duffel bags, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel there that said, uh, what are you going to do with those? And I said, I'm taking them back home. He says, we can ship them for you. <laughs> well, that's the last I saw. Just he, he had two bags of memorabilia that I, I had collected.